place maintenant à notre prochain intervenant. Euh, il est entrepreneur, chercheur, président, cofondateur en 2012 de Without Model et vient nous parler justement euh, d'exemples d'open business model dans six industries, les arts, la culture, le data, la production, les sciences et l'éducation. Je vous demande d'accueillir M. Louis-David Benyaïer. Good afternoon, I'm Louis-David Benyayer, I'm a researcher, as has been said, and I'm also the co-founder of uh, Without Model, which is a think tank dedicated to uh, foster open, collaborative, and responsible business models. Uh, actually, we're uh, tackling those models for two reasons. The first one is a kind of activism. We strongly think that those models are built for our future and to meet the challenges our new environment uh, demands. And the second reason is that we feel a little bit frustrated because at the same time that we see so many initiatives, inspiring initiatives related to open, we are frustrated because we feel that they have some difficulties in scaling and sustaining their impact. And our hypothesis is that with, we should work on, uh, on the business models. So that's Uh, our starting point. And that's the question we try to address in the study I will briefly uh, present to you today. It's an attempt to map the existing business models in six industries. This study uh, has been realized thanks to uh, 53 uh, contributors among which uh, Guillaume, who uh, presented right before, among which Chloe Bonnet, who will present right after me. So I'm not trying that I'm the second non-official organizer, right? But uh, I would spare you the list of the 53 ones, but uh, if you're interested, know that Bernard Stiegler, Michel Bowen, Tristan Nito, and other um, very, very interesting people have contributed to that. And in six months, They've produced 35 articles, uh, 25 videos. They have organized eight events. And we had the opportunity to propose 14 actions to the French government related to the new digital law that is under, undergoing. So when I was um, asked to give a synthesis of all this work, well, you can imagine that in 15 minutes, the task is quite hard, but I'll try to highlight Uh, from my personal point of view, and I will speak from, from my point of view, what are the key learnings and uh, results that we, uh, uh, that we had? Um, if, I'm, if I succeed in moving the slides. So, so when we started, we were inspired by a few examples that some of you already know, and I forgot to mention Christian Quest from OpenStreetMap. But OpenStreetMap was one of the examples that inspired us and triggered our study, because you know that uh, equivalent to Wikipedia in, in mapping. Other examples in other fields uh, related to manufacturing, like Protei, is an open source drone dedicated to clean the pollution in uh, oceans. And it's been designed by a community, financed by the community, and it's now operating, and it's backed by a guy called Cesar Harada, who was previously a researcher at the MIT. Another example, uh, also in the manufacturing, it's uh, a company, an Italian company called Open Source Vehicle, and well, it's self-explaining, and they've uh, created that car, of course, that you see that it's not finished. It's called Tabby, you can buy it. It's not a project, it's sold, 2,000 euros, And as you can see, it's sold without, with very, uh, in a modular way. So when you buy it, you buy it in parts. And the claim, the commercial claim, is that you can assemble it in 41 minutes. So I don't know what's your experience with building stuff uh, like IKEA, I heard. Mine is more or less terrible. So I'm not so confident in the 41 minutes, but let Let's agree on the fact that anybody can do it uh, beyond the time. And what's more interesting is that, as you can see, the car is really limited. It means that it doesn't come with any customization. 
And it's ex exactly the point. The point of Tabby is to build an automotive platform based on an open source module. So it appeals to other um, contributors to develop uh, new uh, customizations for, for that car. And we were lucky enough to witness during our study a major move from a very traditional actor, a very business-minded guy and company, Elon Musk from Tesla Motors, the electric vehicle company, you know, the, the, the cars, the electric cars that go 200 kilometers per hour, so not compared with the Zoe from Renault, um, and they have very uh, aggressive designs, etc. Nothing personal with Renault, right? And that guy who had built a very strong intellectual property to design those uh, motors and technology, well, he said in June that he would open all that intellectual property for other users to uh, use it and build their own activity on that. So that's particularly interesting because it means that even very, very business-minded people are now uh, tr uh, engaging into open um, models and it, they do not do that for philanthropic uh, reasons. And that leads me to share with you one of the main or the first conclusion of our work. Uh, we dig into six industries, arts and culture, manufacturing, software, data, education and science. Um, and one of the first conclusion is that the diversity is huge. We cannot compare Tesla with Wikipedia. Uh, and we concluded saying that there are two categories of business models that are really, really, really different because they're not based on the same motivations. The first one, which is the historic one that we label as activist, and you can uh, recognize perhaps uh, Richard Stallman, those business models are created, they emerge and they developed first to create a social value related to freedom, to access of knowledge and liberty. And digging into those sectors, we identified that there were other initiatives that are, let's say, more pragmatic, people that come from business orientations, and they say, well, it's just a good way of making business because it's more efficient, it's faster, or it consumes less resources. It's a way to enter new business, it's a way to enter existing businesses and challenge the incumbents. And of course you can imagine that those two business models differ a lot and cannot be compared. When we tried to map and to organize those business models, we identified a series of questions. And the other conclusion is that the framing open versus closed is not the adequate way of categorizing these initiatives. It's more a continuum, ranging from totally closed to totally opened. And initiatives, they range according to series of criteria, like the reasons, what is open? Is it a design, data, as was uh, explained, process, places, until which it's open? Can the people be only use it? Can they modify it? Can they make money on it? Etc. So we mapped the landscape and we identified three territories. The first one which is related to the open initiatives, uh, the, the one that I mentioned previously. A second one which is quite important are the platforms that enhance and uh, facilitate the work of those initiatives. And the third one are the open strategies that are implemented by, let's say, traditional actors. And those three fields, in, in those three fields, there are several business models that emerge or develop. If we look at the open initiatives, the, the, the very first one and the a st very strong uh, business model is the contributive one. You, you know it from Wikipedia, OpenStreetMap, <coughs> Linux, Protein in the manufacturing. In those business models, 
the resources, the time, and uh, the brain of the people is not uh, retributed. People do not get paid for that. And the level of openness is very high because people can, of course, use it, but they can also modify it. And they collect their money through gifts or foundation. This model is very clear and very efficient according to the goal that the organization uh, takes. The second one, and of course many of you coming from the software industry know it very well, hybrid models that combines resources that are uh, paid and others that are volunteers. Uh, the level of openness is somehow lower and they collect their revenue through products and services. And what has been very interesting is that we saw that model in many, many industries. And if I can pick an example of open classrooms, which is a platform of open education, and they produce and broadcast MOOCs, and that was a, an interesting point raised by the, the guy from that company when we invited to a talk, because he said, well, next year, will uh, produce 600 MOOCs. And right after him, it, there was a president of a university. And when we asked him the question, well, how many MOOCs will you produce? He said, well, we're very proud to announce that we'll produce three MOOCs. So three, 600, right? And the uh, open classroom, they do not get any money directly from the MOOCs. So where did the money come from? Well, they sell books and they sell e-books and they sell certifications. So products and services are a way to complement the revenue source. In a very similar way, dual models uh, like freemiums that al also is used in many software is uh, implemented in manufacturing or in photography like Trey Radcliffe. And you know that there is a huge debate about photography and digitalization of photography. And Trey Radcliffe offers free its photographs for people if they do not make money on it. But if people make money on it, well, it takes a, a commission. Funding platforms, you know them, and they collect their money through commission and services. And in other uh, industries like science, we observed that some platforms now are collecting revenue through data because they collect a huge amount of data related to the content that is uh, read by the people, uh, the number of hours that they spend, etc., etc., and they're now selling the data to other people that uh, feel, uh, find an interest in it. Of course, and that's a question that's raised among which by Michel Bowens, which is, who is a peer-to-peer um, theorists and he said, of course, those platforms, well, they raise a question because they could attract a huge number of value and when it comes to sharing the value with the people that created it, well, it's not so easy. And finally, the open strategies. More and more uh, corporations are opening and we have a few examples and of course, open innovation tracks gives us a lot, a lot of example of that. But more interesting, they're mobilizing their clients into their value chain. They ask the clients to work for them more or less freely. So, of course, uh, and I'm about to finish now, or now I'm just out of time, right? Um, but let me take one minute to conclude. So, of course, it's a very humble work, right, that we are trying to make through that study. We're just trying to map the models in order to give information to people that are now trying to engage themselves or move into those models to say, well, that's how other do. And if you want to be inspired, just do it. And the other limits that we had to face during the, uh, the, the, the final run of the study is that, well, it's just the beginning. We worked on six industries and we said, well, that's a huge amount of work. But when we were working, we saw that that openness is now tackling currencies. And you've all heard about Bitcoins and other cryptocurrencies. And you've heard about Ethereum, uh, which is now starting. It also concerns seeds and health. Uh, health with prosthetics, open source prosthetics. So my conclusion is that the question is no longer, will those models 
develop? Where will they emerge? The real question is that at which pace they will develop and how they will coexist with the existing ones that are not so open. Thank you.